Hey everyone, it's Derek G Speaks Volumes and we have a very, very special guest. I say that all the time, but I've been very excited to speak to one Yasi Salek, who is in the room, in our rooms together. Hi Yasi, how are you? Hi Derek, am I more special than the other guest? Be honest. Yes, you're oh, yeah. significant. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm very like bombastic about these things sometimes, but it's like you do important shit. Well, I think so anyway. Thank you. I don't know who the other guests are, but apologies to them. I'm special. <laughs> you are. You are. I should give you a little introduction for those who don't know you, but I, there's so much to talk about today. So Yasi is the host of Bandsplain and you just dropped a brand new podcast as well. You're doing, you got two podcasts now, am I right? That's right. I'm mentally ill. <laughs> Bandsplain is the kind of one that you're most known for yeah. which is on the ringer network Correct. if i'm not mistaken and yeah. you essentially deep dive is an understatement into <laughs> bands i'm guessing a lot of them are like your favorite bands you're not picking just random uh, yeah you know. um it's it's an interesting process the picking of the bands it's not always my favorites i do probably subconsciously avoid bands I super don't like because I have to spend several weeks <laughs> researching them and that's a little bit lay mis. Do you know what I mean? But it's it more has to do with like what I think would be a compelling episode paired with who I think would be a compelling guest. I think the the way that people if people to would just because people have mentioned your podcast to me in the past the thing that people say, which I'm sure you've heard before, is like, yeah. It's too long. You know, like, no, no. <laughs> people are like, it's Well, the too length long. is also, part of it. Annoying. They're like, <laughs> oh, Ben Splain, that podcast where it's like three, four, five hours talking about that's right. artists. That's that's the one. That's what that's everyone right. needs to know, which is yeah. like, I've got so many questions around that. But I think, <laughs> I think you know, to, to kind of lay a bit of the groundwork of the context, I think I kind of. I like to reach out to people or talk to people that just have a, a take a perspective on music that is not just like a musician and how did you write this song, but you you play a part of like a obviously an entertainer, but like a, a researcher, an archivist, and a storyteller. And um, I can, I kind of do a very short form version of music storytelling a little bit, and you do, yeah, you do. like a very well researched and well informed. <laughs> Yeah, you're smarter because yours has a lower barrier to entry and people <laughs> will watch it more and it's easy but mine that people are like oh five hours you say good luck with that babe <laughs> do you have super fans because the sure. few people must feel like they know you right sure yeah <laughs> well, a you? lot of parasocial a lot of parasocial <laughs> relationships going on there babe and that's okay <laughs> how, that's you, just... <laughs> how what sort of what sort of people are in your dms i mean by and large, the audience is men in their, you know, mid 30s to 50s, maybe. It's like a very like late millennial Gen X men. That's not everyone. I mean, tons of women listen to it, tons of young people. But I would say like the bulk, <laughs> the median, if we we're doing a little bell curve, <laughs> is that. Why? 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 <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's a good question. Um, I don't know. I think partially probably because of the eras of the bands that I cover are the bands. I mean, they're my age, these men, you know, I'm 41. Um, so they were important to these people in their youth. Um, I don't know what I, I thought women, more women listen to podcasts, but just not my podcast. You were talking about astrology and, and things before we right. we jumped on. So maybe yeah. it's maybe you can cross over the two. Yeah, I'm trying. I want to try to talk about my skincare and my raw milk and stuff and see if that Please. will be well, well received by the, the, male, That's your TikTok. <laughs> the male population. <laughs> so tell me, like, how do you how do you talk about yourself and what you do and how do you kind of uh yeah, explain it to a, an audience, whether it's parents or people that, you know, cab drivers and things. What what do you say you do? I mean, that's tough, right? I'm like, do, do you even think that most people, I guess like it depends what audience you're talking about. Like, I think my parents finally understand what a podcaster is, but just barely. Like, it's like a little bit like, where can I hear, what time is that on? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's still a little bit, is it the radio? Um, 
yeah, I just, I mean, I just say nobody wants to be a podcaster when they grow up, but some people do become one and that's what I became. <laughs> you you are a natural letter. I think that you're a, like naturally personable, entertaining and and feel very relaxed in the state of like the unknown, which is podcasting sometimes. Do you feel like, where, where does that come from? Do you always like, like to talk or to like entertain or? Um... I was a really unattractive child. And so I had to develop um, a s strong sense of humor <laughs> to um, survive. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and so that's just sort of been the vibe <laughs> since early on. We grew out of that. As you can tell, thank God this is a video podcast. I often joke that I am imprisoned by the audio format where I'm actually very hot and no one knows that. Um, but yeah, I think it came from that. And I always just kind of liked attention, probably. I mean, I was really shy and I until I realized that this is a thing I could do that would like endear people to you. I mean, isn't that sort of why people are funny, you know? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm funny, so I, I wouldn't know. I think I was like the, uh, I was the kid that wasn't popular. So I had to find like ways to like bur burrow myself into even less popular things to make myself feel cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that was your defense mechanism. You're like, oh, I'm just going to like go into things that are even like where I can be the big fish in the un, in the uncool pond, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Genius. That's my whole identity. Genius. <laughs> you like that? Yeah. Yuck. Yeah. Gross. And you're, you wouldn't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So does, does the band's playing being so well researched and such a deep dive, does that like, I don't want to say obsessiveness because it's just, it's, it's heavily researched at the end of the day, but it does feel yeah. like... It's an intense way to present something, but I've listened to multiple and it's just like you learn so much and you get so into it and you, you it's like you, you kind of like sink into this, this experience almost of just like spending so much time with you. Has that always been a part of you, that kind of wanting to kind of go f further and deeper and, and, and just kind of explore that kind of realm? I mean, I think so. I, I, I don't know. I can't speak for all fellow teen <laughs> 90s teens but I felt like it was such like a hallmark of being a teenager for me like in the 90s where like I would find out about something and then I would like need to know all of it so I would have to like every magazine interview that came out I would have to go find it and read it fanzine and that was sort of always a thing that I would do um books whatever um but I think because on the podcast, it just started to like become clear to me like two things. Like one was that a lot of the stuff about bands of the kind that I cover are is out there. A lot of it's out there, you know, like in, in like a TLDR way. But I, I started to be like, oh, there's so much other stuff. And it all is kind of important. And I was like, I don't want to like leave this out because it's kind of important. <laughs> like you can, you can trace something meaningful in like, you know, a song that people love from something that this artist did when they were nine. <laughs> and I think that's so cool to know about. Do you have those like experiences often where you're like, you actually discover something that you feel like hasn't been discussed? I don't, I don't know because I, I mean, this is my usually like, you know, my first round of going this deep on a band with, with the internet. <laughs> so I'm not sure, but like, I do get messages all the time. Like, like I got a message from some like older man who's like, Oh, the clash has been my favorite band since like 1979 or whatever. And I learned new things about them from you. I, I do want to get into like the, the larger themes and, and kind of patterns that you might see with different sure. bands that I'm really ex interested in because you've researched in depth so many, <laughs> but how does it feel to have a platform where do you feel the responsibility on your shoulders to do this sort of, in, in some ways, either accurately or ways that people, if this person, this older gentleman grew up listening to The Clash and getting that right or potentially wrong, does that, do you think about that, feel that, or is it, or do people come at you for that sort of thing? I don't care at all all about getting the facts right like the year like i don't fucking care sorry like that is not important and if like you have don't have google i don't know what to tell you like i remember someone i just like offhandedly was like oh, i think the beatles were around these years i didn't it wasn't even a beatles episode it was simply and someone like wrote me and was like actually 
the Beatles were this year's. And I'm like, yeah, I don't have it memorized. I don't have the active years of the Beatles memorized because I'm not a fucking loser. Like those things don't matter. You know what I mean? But like I do, I do feel a responsibility to like get the like gist of it. Right. You know, like to like not misrepresent like maybe intentions. I mean, we do a lot of speculation on the show because a lot of it is opinion, you know, so that part is fun. Um, but I, that's why I kind of, I got into the weeds on the details. Cause I was like, man, if someone was like talking about my entire career retrospective, God forbid, no one ever will, because people don't do that with podcasters. I would want them to get into all of it. I would want them, I wouldn't want them to like take shortcuts or like not, you know, not talk about big swaths of things that might've been really important to me. <laughs> kind of fact checking of it is kind of weird but i guess that you're right like this the speculation of it is really the like part of the entertainment of the podcast i feel like that there's like a, a line with your with bands playing about like there's the stories but then it's the conversation do, do you feel like that's like could you, you could you do it on your own or do you feel like you need that kind no, of like i feel like do I'm you think really, aspect to it yeah i really need someone to like bounce things off of and I hear their opinion and sort of like go off on these little tangents. Like that's like to me the best part. That's the funnest part. That's the unknown of the podcast. If it was just me, I would just be reading my Google Doc. Who cares about that? You know? Yeah. It's um a pining. <laughs> it it makes so much sense because like you might be voicing the stuff that we're all thinking about as fans of that artist, of like, oh, I wonder if that meant that that, but it it doesn't feel Outside of a podcast realm, it might not feel like "quote unquote" journalism to be like just pondering something without answering that question. But yeah, exactly. Maybe that's like, because sometimes we don't even answer it, right? We just ponder it. I also, I like, I like chat podcasts. I mean, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, but like, and I think this, like, the thing that I tried to do with Bandsplain was make it a combination. Like, it's not a classic it's not a storytelling podcast it's not scripted you know i have a google doc but it's just bullet points of information there's no scripting so it is like a chat show it's just a really long chat show that has a structure that's so true i hadn't thought about it like that but i think that's my favorite part of the podcast the the chat rather yeah than the i don't know if people i i mean I, I can't speak for other people but like I couldn't sit and listen to like a five hours ken burns scripted podcast like i don't think i could do it um maybe those exist i'm not sure probably yeah <laughs> so you've done like mf doom to steely dan to insane clown posse and you're talking <laughs> yeah. about the selection process like you what what does that what does that look like and do you are you holding some back or are you intimidated by some or are sure. you like of course <laughs> chomping at the bit to do others like how does it work yeah i mean there's there's i have a huge list of bands i want to tackle um it's definitely broke an artist it's definitely broken up also i have a secret list called short discography bands <laughs> which i need to go to when i'm very tired because it takes a lot of time the, the longer the discography the longer it takes usually unless it's like the smiths or something who it doesn't matter that's going to take forever it doesn't matter they only have four albums because they're like the beatles um it really boils down to finding the right guest for me. Cause that's so important. Like, just like I, we were just talking about how the conversation to me is the most important part. That means I have to find a guest who would want to do the artist that I want to do because they have to be passionate about it and will be a good time. So that dictates a lot of how I schedule. How does that work? Do you, cause you have like a, a bit of a rotation of people that, that come on. Do you, yeah. do you know what they like? Do you ask them? Do you have a little chat? Those people I'll sometimes ask, sometimes I'll pick a band and then I'll start asking around to see oh, wow. who people think would be good for it. Um, and so, or sometimes I'll be like, oh, I just want to do one with Rob Harvilla cause he's the best. And I'll be like, what do you, what would you want to do? You know? Oh, so like, I, I, I never thought about it like that. Do you want them to have like an encyclopedic knowledge of it or like no. a super fandom of them or a lived want them experience? To be passionate about it. Like the soup the encyclopedic part is I take care of that. They don't need to it's it's nice if they just have a general sense <laughs> because they've been a fan, but they don't need to know everything because I have all the facts. Just want them to be excited 
and love the band and want to talk about it. Got it. Wow. That's kind of flipping the whole thing on my head about like, I, I figure you kind of just choose it. You bring someone on that's available, <laughs> like not no, available, obviously no. they mean, know about it. but Sometimes that happens and you can probably hear it, but it, I try not to do that. <laughs> who's, in the, who's in the short discography list? The, the breeders. Moment. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Maybe Everclear. Isn't that Everclear only has like six or seven? Uh, um, that's still quite a lot. I, I thought you meant like one or two. Would be that would be a really short episode. Um, and I try not to do anything less than four. Well, because like you know, how iconic can you be if you didn't put out three or four albums? You know. <laughs> well, that's interesting. That's true. Has there been a episode that has completely ruined? an artist for you almost every single time if i go in a little skeptical about the artist i come out with a greater appreciation not necessarily for the music but just for them as an artist because if you really study someone's creative journey and output you can't help but feel endeared to them and feel like you know like oh like it's so it takes so much of to put yourself and heart into like making music but I don't like fish. I think they seem like lovely people and their fan base seems lovely and there's no personal thing. I just cannot stand the music. I'm so and, sorry. Please don't come for me. It's just not for me. And the skepticism, Some things are not for me. <laughs> the skepticism didn't wear off. Oh my God, it, I, I, was, I was not skeptical enough, Derek. I, oh. I was like, oh, I'm sure, surely I won't like this. And then I was like, oh, it couldn't, it couldn't be that bad. And it was far worse than I ever could have imagined <laughs> again is there, an, so is there an opposite to the fish community um <laughs> the fish community a big it's a quite a large community um, insane clown posse like i don't i had like a fondness for like you know i knew one or two songs and i thought they were like coolish but i was like you know i never really got into insane clown posse but after learning about them and like the fan base and like this really special relationship that they have with their fans and how supportive they are and how they started these like gatherings of the juggalo for like you know, basically displaced young people who came from broken homes and all it really, my heart swelled. Like I, I was so moved by what you wouldn't, I think most people wouldn't expect that this band creates with their community. I, um, I know you did a podcast on her, but like I interviewed a, a, a diehard Swifty a few months ago nice. and I haven't, been a fan of Taylor Swift I didn't but I didn't really get it I just didn't yeah. get it and it's a similar thing where I like now I think Taylor Swift is an absolute genius she is. I'm not a fan of the music that's okay <laughs> but I'm just like look at what you've built <laughs> exactly yeah and I think that's kind of the beauty of going down these these rabbit holes of understanding music and art in in many ways speaking of Swifties and fan bases Best and worst fan bases that you've encountered. Oof. Um, I love I have like I love fandom. So I'm like sympathetic and moved and touched by like almost all fandom. I think it's so sweet. Except I don't like um the Radiohead fandom. I find it to be the one of the worst ones. But otherwise, everybody else is great. <laughs> why? Tell me why. I'm just kidding. I don't know. I don't know. I, don't don't you get the sense that the Radiohead fandom is like a bunch of well actually guys? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Like, it's, like, truly just made up of, like, well, did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you, have you like done it a Radiohead ruins It ruins it for younger people. I, I genuinely, like, producer Dylan was, like, I can't stand Radiohead. I'm, like, have you listened to Radiohead? She's, like, not really, but I already know I won't like it. And it's because the fan base put her off. <laughs> that happens, especially if you're a woman, I think. Yeah, we did it. We did yeah, a two-part wow. Radiohead episode. I think, honestly, it's our most popular episodes to date is part one and part two of Radiohead. No, if I, now, the, I've, the, now I've alienated them. They're not going to listen anymore. Like, Fuck our you, most bitch. popular, the most loved. Um, <laughs> that's the thing about what you do, though. I, I do want to get back to the Radiohead thing, but I think like being this, this to use a cringe term, but like evergreen content, like it mm, is there. Right. Like, yeah. f you know, when I want to learn about, say, for example, I didn't know much about, um, this is not music, but like Charlie Manson. I didn't. Yeah, I uh -huh. looked up a podcast, Charlie. listened yeah. to two or three. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Charles, Charles, Chuck, Charlie, your, your buddy my friend. Yeah. <laughs> um, see, this is how much I don't know about it. Um, <laughs> um, I went to podcasts and then just digested yeah. 
two or three and I'm like, oh, okay, I get the world, I get the context, I get the theories and all that sort of stuff. Your thing, if if people now, later, younger, older want to go, I just want to understand this, you're there and, and you are the resource. Like you could go like someone with a 20 minute podcast on Radiohead, but if you want to know, no, no. You're there. Like, do that was you do kind of the impetus of the podcast? Honestly, it was kind of like the original idea was like bands for dummies, basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like, it was like, okay, like there's bands that like you've heard of your whole life, but maybe like they seem so inaccessible because they're so massive, and you're like, I'm fine the rest of my life only knowing Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin and nothing further. But like, what if you could just? go listen to like a primer and then it just started to spin out of control and get really long and detailed. So I feel like hopefully it speaks to both people that are just curious and also people that are diehard fans who just want to bathe in the (laughs) bathe in more talking and knowledge about their favorite band. And it's also like, it gets to a point where like I listened to the white stripes one, which Mm -hmm. is like very close to my heart when I was growing up. And it was like, (laughs) I know I, I, yeah. Anyway, we could go into that, but, um, (laughs) I, it was, it's kind of reliving and, and re-familiarizing yeah. oneself as well. So it's like for people like me, it's like, it's a text of like your adolescence or whatever. Totally. Totally. How does it feel? Like, I know you've mentioned in interviews before about like music journalism and criticism. Yeah. And. I don't do that. Do you, <laughs> <laughs> do you where Couldn't do you position. Me. Where do you position yourself? Do you like? Do you find? Do you relate to being a critic at all? Or do you prefer to be more of a kind no. of storyteller journalist? I'm definitely not a critic. What I do isn't criticism. I mean, it just it just isn't. Like I don't <laughs> I don't identify with being a critic. I'm not smart enough to be a critic. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. But it's just that's not. I don't. I don't even know if it's journalism. Although people say it is. I. I think it's. Just, I don't know. It's just podcasting. It's just chatting. <laughs> it's just <laughs> some facts and some vocal fry just spun together into a beautiful little confection for you. So you are you saying that you don't consider what you do to be journalism? I mean, is it? Is that what journalism is? <laughs> <laughs> I I genuinely don't know. <laughs> No, you're right. You're right. Because I kind of like call myself now like a music commentator. I'm not a journalist. Like, yeah. I don't, I'm like, the, I first of all, I'm illiterate. Them. Secondly, there's like literally people who are like writing, you know, th- 3,000 words for the Washington Post that would like to have a word with me about being a journalist. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I'm just like, I don't know, babe. I just get on here. I talk for a living somehow and I do research. That's... And anyone can have a podcast, but not many people can actually. Anyone can, stick but around. not everyone should. Much like making music, just because everyone can doesn't mean everyone should. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. There's the more I pick, dig into music, the, the the more I realize how bad most. Of <laughs> the barrier music to entry is. has gotten very low for everything, and it is yielding the results that you would expect. <laughs> I was asked to uh, uh, judge a category of an award, like a music awards, which Mm -hmm. I won't name because I'm still in the process of it. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, sure. I've never done this before. And it's horrible. (laughs) And you're like, um, Hey, they're all bad. They all, I don't want it. How do I, how do we not do this? Yeah. I'm like, I, this is, I didn't realize it was so much horror. Like it's really changed how I think about like certain, (laughs) this certain genre now. But, um, what I want to ask you about, uh, uh, now that we've kind of understood a little bit of your process of the the band splaining is <laughs> uh, music and musicians what what do you define as impact that's a hard that's a journal that's a question for a journalist babe i told you i am brain dead podcaster what, can you can, do you have, do you have a list of questions for brain dead podcaster because that's what you invited on um i this is not the answer to your question but i will tell you that I feel like one thing that I've really has imparted on me is that it's that Jim Jarmish thing, right? Like it's not where you take it from, it's where you take it to. But like every band starts because of some other band. <laughs> it's 
that that's just the golden rule. Like you don't just start a band inside a Petri dish. You start a band because you saw another band and you're like, that's cool as fucking hell. And it might not even be anything to do with what your band ends up sounding like. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, like Radiohead is named after a Talking Heads song. Do you feel that Radiohead sounds like the Talking Heads? Thankfully not. <laughs> Talking heads are good, Derek. Um, they are. Or like, they are. or like Morrissey was obsessed with the New York Dolls. Do the Smiths sound like the New York Dolls? No, you know, like. But these are these. Are the, there's an impetus, and then sometimes there's more direct. But I think influence is so much more cultural often than it is sonic. Yeah. Wow. It's the, they inspire something in your heart that makes you want to like. I want to do what they do. You know. In a sense, you kind of reverse what the question was which is like the impact was on the the creators of the next thing yeah like like you know that that's like that cla- the classic story of the sex the second first and second sex pistols shows in manchester and how many bands started because of those that don't sound like the sex pistols like marky e. smith from the fall was there um morrissey was there peter hook and um bernard sumner were there they started joy division like None of those bands sound like the Sex Pistols, but they all started because of the Sex Pistols. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And the Sex wow. Pistols and the Clash started because they saw the New York Dolls on the fucking, you know, old gray whistle test. They don't sound like the New York Dolls. <laughs> like, it's... Yeah. Sorry, I'm stuck in this era because this is, you know, something I've recently researched, but... When you when you start to realize just the, like, interconnectedness, I think that's what, like... It's my favorite. ...has thing. resonated yeah. with <laughs> what I do is, like, me almost, like, talking about and learning... I think the first video that went viral for me was like uh, a Tunisian song that inspired a, this Boney M song. And I was mm. like, wait, what? Because yeah. like, how does that happen? And then that kind of like, you start to realize that and that, that kind of Tunisian song has got, it goes back like hundreds or thousands of years yeah. or something like that, which is kind of blows my mind a little bit. Speaking of thousands of years and not mm. that at all. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> uh, Gorgeous you, segue. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned life, like albums and lengths of time of bands. Yeah. So like short time spans. Sure. Uh, speaking of segues, the, what, what do you see is like in your experience, what do you think is the perfect lifespan for a band? Oh, man. I mean, I I think that bands should go on forever, even if they stop putting out music that is as good in the estimation of their fan base, because that's their right. You know what I mean? Like, because if a band stops, like, it's fine. You'll be preserved in amber. You'll be the Smiths. You know, you'll be Nirvana. You'll be this sort of, like, unimpeachable. But... It gets so much more interesting (laughs) the further along they go, you know, might not get better. It definitely doesn't get better. That's one of my that's one of my most uh, strongly held and most disliked theories is that um, 98 percent of the time there's like a point of diminishing returns and that rock music is a young person's game. (laughs) Same with like I was thinking about hip hop. It's a similar thing where like Jay-Z makes more money investing in a, a, a company yeah, than he does doing a youthful, world tour. these are youthful genres. They're, they're visceral, right? They're like, they benefit from the immediacy of youth, the lack of overthinking, the like, I'm going to die if I don't do this because you don't have any perspective. <laughs> like those are the most common traits of youth and they lend themselves so beautifully to like urgent music, like rock music and hip hop. It doesn't, it's not as urgent when you're 50, you know? And that is, again, that is fine. You just keep making it. And it doesn't mean that people don't make redeemable music that's still good. It's just never gonna, almost never. People loved, well, actually me on this one, fine. Write a list, I don't care. That's five of them versus like 50 million of the rest of them who made their best work in their like 20s. That's just how, it's not the same with every art form, right? It's like, it really is so specific to like two or three genres of music painters get better over time you know so many other things but authors yeah i find it really interesting i i i thought about that a lot as well that that there's this uh, some some like i read somewhere it was something like george michael wrote careless whisper at like 17 or something yeah. crazy like that. i mean robert smith wrote a lot of like the most iconic cure songs when he was 16 17 boys don't cry like all those songs how is that even possible <laughs> It's just stream of consciousness. Touched like this by the pure hand emotion. of God. I think you'd, you're not 
able to overthink it because you don't know enough to overthink it. You know what I mean? And also it's like the Occam's, this is not actually what Occam's razor means, so never mind, but whatever. It's the thing of like often the simpler, it's it's close enough. The simpler explanation, the sim- simpler uh, expression is better. <laughs> but when the more you learn about your craft and the more you do, you don't want to go to the simpler expression. You want to complicate it and it isn't going to be as good. Do you believe in that hand of God thing, like you said? Because yes. like if I was, <laughs> when I tried to write things at 16, 17, like it was so cringe. I was trying too hard. Like obviously yeah. I wasn't an artist and like I wasn't like seeing through that lens, but I was trying to be what I thought that I should be. And it came like if anyone heard those lyrics, they are awful. But yeah. some people have it. Like what where where do you think that comes from? I do think some people are vessels. I think all people are vessels. It just depends what on for what. But I think people that can tap into being a vessel in that way, and it can be for a variety of reasons, you get the most amazing things from them. And you can say things, Robert Smith can say things that don't sound trite at age 16, just because. Yeah. Just because. <laughs> just because. <Just> <laughs> That's the answer. Yeah. If, if there was a band mm-hmm. that was blowing up, had a massive EP, first album, and they, you, you were put in a room with them and they said, you know, you've learned so much about musicians and artists and industry you know about the 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 successes the pitfalls the shortcomings the like blow-ups and they said what what would you advise for us what would you say (laughs) oh man i'd be like i'm not qualified to give you this information i i would say just do it the way you want to do it always and wherever the chips may fall, you know, don't try to do it like someone else did it. And don't try to do it like you think you should do it. Just do it. I think most artists have an intuition and following the intuition yields really good art. And it should apply to the rest of your everything, you know, if you can, if you can access it. Like I read, I, I don't know, I read, I've, just took a pause then. I really liked hearing that. I think that do you, there's usually one one or two people in the group that have that, like sure. the ones that succeed, not not sure. everyone. It's like, yeah, and that can be where it falls apart, I guess, when someone has the intuition and the other people don't and feel like. And don't agree. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or have different priorities, true. What do you think about um, luck versus fate of these artists that you you cover? It's hard to say because I don't, totally believe in luck like I do feel like it's all sort of part of their fate you know but I do think that there has there are always this is I think one thing that's come up so many episodes of Bands Plan, which we like have become it's become like a trope which is like talent is never enough you also have to have like two to three of these like sort of like fateful interventions or occurrences to become what you become such as could be anything. I mean, it could be meeting your bandmate that you w- wouldn't have n- been able to, like, if, like if more if Johnny Marr hadn't come and knocked on Morrissey's door and been like, "Let's be in a band," we might never have heard of Morrissey in our lives. You know what I mean? Like, doesn't mean he's not incredibly talented, <laughs> you know, or being seen by another big artist and that that blowing up. I think the talking heads like Seymour Stein saw them by accident because he was trying to see another band. You know, there's, there's all sorts of these stories that come up being able to play a show with a bigger band for no reason, except that like maybe you met them at a bar and struck up a conversation, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then the person that, that person is the one person that gets what they're trying to do because people in in my experience it's like uh these people are buzzing already people know about them but maybe that there's not that person that knows what where to take it or or what yeah. how it can work and how it can resonate and that person can then help them translate it into oh my god totally the it or everything in yeah. a sense i've kind of to and fro between this kind of thought 
But do you feel like you you need to have a bit of a darker or troubled past to be like really resonant in music? Mm, I think probably the human experience is dark and troubled enough for almost everybody. <laughs> um, obviously to varying degrees, but you know, to be alive is suffering. Um, but I do think that the resonance of that sort of we talked about it a bit like there's a little bit of a difference between like trafficking in in misery and trafficking in the perspective that you've achieved through your misery and i think it's the latter that people respond to more i mean both have their audience for sure <laughs> but i i think like there is a there's like a certain amount of like i i got through that and now i can write about it I, I speak to a lot of young artists and sometimes I look at it, not I don't, I don't, not through that lens, but sometimes you just know that some people have that thing that they want to communicate and others are just like, I'm making music and I have a good voice. Right, which, I mean, good on you, but, you know. Completely, <laughs> completely. I just like, you you, you can't advise them on, on, no, on no. having that But there's experience. an honesty, I think, in in sort of transposing your your pain into art, you know, and like people respond to it because you want to feel seen in art and, a lot, you know, it's easy. It's easy to see pain. <laughs> now, when I, I think I first reached out to you because I was listening to that White Stripes podcast and you're talking mm -hmm. about the spectrum of masculinity and femininity. So right. what you was, what you said which I wrote down was you have this argument about music. You think that all music can be put on a spectrum of masculine and feminine, not necessarily defined by gender, but no, by arch archetypes. That, yeah. That expression. So like, obviously you've, you've thought and analyzed a lot of music. I'd love to hear more about that thought. And I guess like within the artist or how it impacts people and how it resonates, like what, what is that, this theory of yours? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty simple. I just, I think all music has within it elements of femininity and masculinity. Again, not gender, the archetype <laughs> of both things. And I think for me, when it gets too far to one side or the other and isn't holding within it the other, it becomes a little more inaccessible. Like for, like for me, when music is like 99% masculine, it doesn't hit for me. It's rare. It's very rare. I even like, there, I mean, like Metallica has femininity in it. You know, like there's, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to, as any, to put out any sort of art that doesn't hold within it both archetypes. Mm, mm. But some people really damn well do try. I'm trying to think of like, I think masculine is quite, for, for me, quite easy to, to like understand the extremes of that. Like not not to put I don't want you to call out in any artists or anything, but what's like the like extreme feminine inaccessible version on that side of the spectrum? Mm, dolphin noises. <laughs> <laughs> Something album. that's like the sound of the moon. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> like, truly esoteric and um, <laughs> mysterious and unknowable. To kind of think about it on your spectrum which you talk about there is masculinity in taylor swift which is like if for i because sure. i went there right i was like oh, okay sure. well, maybe oh my god for i don't sure relate to is. taylor maybe that's ultra feminine but it's like no there is a masculinity, Tons of masculinity, masculinity is, for and, sure yeah i would i would i would even think actually taylor swift music is is maybe more a little more masculine than it is feminine sometimes in terms of what in your in your kind of thinking it might just be like the the impetus the feeling behind it but the like sort of like you could tell that it's meant it's it's competing that it's meant to be it's really trying to achieve achievement is masculine one upping <laughs> getting yeah i mean something. tons of femininity too obviously you know this is like she's she's very she's very deft at uh dealing with really um universally accessible themes of like love and and longing and stuff and you know longing is feminine i like that what what where does your favorite um fandom what is what does radiohead fit on the spectrum i think radiohead's music is pretty 
pretty even. It has a lot of femininity in it. It gets a little more masculine as it goes along. Like later catalog to me is a little more masculine, but I'm simply riffing here. I don't know. This is not a science. I'm just be talking about how it feels. <laughs> it's like porn. You know, I just know it when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. The, the, the longing and the kind of uh, more emotive elements of Radiohead, especially the earlier stuff, like you said, yeah, um, being more feminine and, and perhaps that, that intersection of of the two is not necessarily where it is more successful or, or less successful, but something that kind of is. I think like it could be said, the most resonant because it appeals to like all the parts of us, you know. What what makes something resonant is it because think like Nirvana, right? You're asking really big questions, Derek. What I makes know, music right? I'm resonant? Sorry. I don't know, man. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Nirvana is more resonant than the music itself oh culturally yeah like i think more people get know understand feel back nirvana than they love the music i think we're about to be on experiencing a nirvana sense i do think it's coming for the music i think it's been long enough that it's almost gonna be I mean, it's classic rock now, you know what I mean? I think it's going to have this sort of like reckoning and revisiting from young people who didn't experience it in real time. And they're going to be like, wow, actually, it's so good. You know what I mean? And I can't, I can't wait for that to come. I really do feel like it's coming. I don't disagree. I feel like when when I was, because I I wasn't old enough to really live through Nirvana in a a meaningful way. And I think when I listened to it, I, I got the hits, but I didn't get. They were my first favorite band. I really lived through it. No, no really? hole, no hole. But yeah, <laughs> I, I absolutely lived the fuck through it. Yeah. Like, I guess what I'm trying to say is like the, the music, you put on an album and it's not like you're like, oh, if you're just completely an outsider to it, it's not like accessible. Are you saying it's mid? Are you saying Nirvana's mid? Is that <laughs> not <saying>? at all. <laughs> Should I? For the sake of the podcast? I think it's, I think it might. It depends what album you're putting on. Like, Nevermind is pretty aggressive. Mm. I think that people don't put that on just to vibe. <laughs> <laughs> but there's tons on Nevermind that I listen to all the time. Like, I listen to Drain You all the time. It's a beautiful song. Like, it's a f- light, a lot. I think the misconception about Kurt Cobain's songwriting is that he was this, like, really angry, depressed, like, songwriter and all his songs sound like that. But he really wrote songs in the very classic, like, Louis Louis esque sense of writing songs. They're all sort of like swinging, you know, really like R and B type rock songs. They're just dirty. They're just made grungy, you know. But structurally, they're very catchy. Did weren't his influences quite like traditional in a sense? Kind of. I mean, I think he was. I think he was. He did learn how to play guitar playing Louis Louis. So there's that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you know, he definitely wasn't trying to, like, reinvent the wheel. He wasn't trying to make, like, complicated prog rock or whatever. Like, he was trying to write good songs, and it was the delivery of the vocals and and the feeling behind it that was different, you know? How do you feel about the Nirvana t-shirts out and about? Does Are you someone that cares? No. <laughs> Why would I care? And that's just what happens. I mean, they... It could have, it feels like it almost, we haven't done a Nirvana episode yet, obviously, and I don't know when we will. I'm sure one day when the I'm 70 years old and it's the last episode of the podcast, but um, in some ways it feels like it could have been any band, but in some ways it could have only been that band. Do you know what I mean? That occupies this place. Does that make sense? <laughs> Go on. Like, I, th- like, I think it makes it's sense. It's not necessarily that their music was so leaps and bounds better than like the pixies for example do you know what i mean or like who were who were an influence on nirvana or rem you know what i mean like rem arguably rem is a much better band i think i think that is (laughs) i think that's like borderline fact at this point you know what i mean but there was just this like again that this fateful thing of the combination of the music, with the persona, with the timing, with everything that made this like it's one of the most most profound um, 
versions of what I've talked about or like everything lined up to make that be the biggest fucking band of all time of the 90s. Like that they invented they rock, they changed rock music, not because of the music, but because of all of the other things, because of the place that they occupied in culture. So of course there's t-shirts, you know, <laughs> there's going to be t-shirts forever. They're, they're a hot topic band now. They're Jimi Hendrix. They're the doors. Very much so. They, it's, and of course, Kurt's death kind of like For sure. sealed that in, but in even- history, right? Even I think it elevated the whole situation for sure. That's lack of a better word. I don't mean like it made things better, but it it made things more impactful. But they Mm. already did what they did two years before he died, you know? Yeah. They changed everything before he died. And then the Foo Fighters haven't. (laughs) Talk to me about the Foo Fighters. (laughs) (laughs) The Foo Fighters haven't negatively impacted the legacy of of, uh, Nirvana. No. <laughs> Why haven't you done the Nirvana episode? Too close, too close. I just need a lot of time for it. It's not that I won't do it. I love Nirvana. They they were they were my first favorite band, but briefly. Hole Hole supplanted them really fast for me. I'm a huge Hole fan. To me, Hole is better than Nirvana. Have you you haven't done a Hole episode, right? No. I will, but it's gonna be a whole thing. Is that one like even like more important to you then to do a whole episode over Nirvana. Episode. They're both important for different reasons. Like whole because it's so personally important to me is going to be a big deal. It was like how PJ Harvey was and Nirvana because it's so important to everyone else. <laughs> yeah, okay. Whole is incredible. Like and I like I, beyond. Whole change I my feel life. like <laughs> they haven't I think they will come back in a way that perhaps hasn't like I feel like Nirvana's always been around but I feel like whole for a younger generation is still kind of lesser known in a sense do you enjoy the 90s sound coming back yeah oh my god i love it my favorite thing right now is that like there's this whole genre of hardcore music that really literally just sounds like 90s but with hardcore vocals i'm obsessed with it (laughs) this is like my favorite thing like they all sound like archers of loaf in a way that is so pleasing to me reliving or like seeing the music that you grew up with recontextualized oh yeah well because music stopped in 2000 right Exactly. It stopped. Yeah, of course. This is a known fact. <laughs> it just, it stopped because of the internet. The internet stopped new genres. It just became more and more recycling, which is fine. I know you're joking, but you're also not. I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I genuinely believe this. Go on, go on. I mean, I, maybe like hyper pop is kind of newish. I mean, people are going to be like, well, actually me, but isn't hyper pop just pop done a little bit different? You know what I mean? Like, it's like, like, I, I just think that like, it's so easy. It's so easy to reference in a way that it wasn't before. It's been for 20 years. And I, I just, I think we, I think we mined, we mined what there was to mine of new genres and we, we did it. We did it all. So now there's just <laughs> going to be sort of like slight iterations of the genres that we already made. Come for me. I don't care. That's what I think. Uh, my, he- my head hurts a little bit thinking about it. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Because, like, yeah, I did do – I made a video last week about Bossa Nova mm-hmm. and about how, like, a lot of pop or indie pop artists are doing Bossa Nova tracks. And I'm kind of like, why? why? And I had my theories around, like, streaming and lockdown and it being this, like, infinitely sunny music that you can just be transported back to. And then yeah. people were like, oh, yeah, also lo-fi hip-hop uses a lot of – bossa nova and also animal crossing and nintendo we used a lot of bossa nova and i'm like oh shit like i didn't connect those worlds to to represent like why bossa nova is back and kind of kind of cool i know it's never gone away but it's never been like cool i should do a bossa (laughs) track and get like millions and millions of listens no i feel like i don't know even hyper pop i'm a bit like it feels a bit like it just came out of I think people wanted it to be a thing. Quickly. It's kind of a thing, but it's also the same as what you're saying. It's like, where did it come out of video game? Do you it, do you game? Do I game? Um, yeah. Not really. I like, I had COVID last year and my brother, who's a saint, was like, I'm going to bring you my Switch. And because I, you know, there's fucking nothing to do. And I got really into playing Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I was really into it. Um but I don't really play anymore. That's a kind of like lens that I don't have or we don't have that like I feel like influences a lot of people's music taste these days. Oh my days. God, beyond. I have Okay, so I have two little cousins who are teenagers. 
they're like, I don't know, 13 and 15 or 14 and 16 or something. And I ask them all the time, I'm like, how do you find music? And they're like, oh, we follow these Minecraft influencers, like Minecraft players that are influencers who then make music playlists. And that's how they learn about music. It's so interesting. That's wild. I find it so fascinating. It's 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 not good or bad. You know what I mean? It's no. neutral. It's neutral how people learn about music. And of course, like, we're all going to think it was better in our time. Like, we're going to think it was better because we found it at the record store through fanzines. And our parents will think it's better because they saw it on the Ed Sullivan show or whatever. But like, it's just different. Uh, I, I kind of find that about myself. I kind of felt like because I was a radio host for so long and then I started doing things on the internet and it's like, oh, this is like a version of radio, but like short form video. But like, it's kind of like this kind of passive experience of people on Minecraft. Also like watching people game, also listening to music. It's like a lot more like holistically experiential than just like, I want to introduce you to music, but like, let me show you something that I'm doing at the same time. Right. And like soundtracking. Do you value soundtracks as a form of like expression? Oh my God, it's like one of my favorite things. Again, that also died in the 90s. That's like a night, that's a very specifically 90s actual physical sound, like soundtracks being to movies being important. You know what I mean? Where like they would change, they would change things or they would break an artist or like the songs that were on a soundtrack were made specifically for the soundtrack of the movie. They weren't just taken from elsewhere. Like that doesn't really happen anymore. What do you mean? It, the, I mean, of course bar- it does. The There's Barbie. scores. <laughs> and the Barbie, of course, the Barbie. I'm just Ken. Um, but, you, you know, like Judgment Night is a great example where they truly like made this whole. I mean, it's incredible, right? It's far surpassed the film that is actually quite bad where they paired. I mean, they basically invented new metal. They paired rappers with hard rockers and had them create original tracks. And it's it's crazy (laughs) like it's so fucking cool like that used to just happen and it's like it's a it's an impetus to create something completely new that's not creating a band you're kind of like capturing a a moment in time that you're therefore putting on iris by the goo goo dolls babe that was written for city of angels that is why the lyrics are told from the perspective of the angel seth (laughs) nobody talks about this babe it's real (laughs) This is your TikTok right here. I know. It's like, okay, I'm going to make a TikTok about that. I really am obsessed <laughs> with Iris. It's such a fucking good song. And when everyone's like, "Why these lyrics make no sense. And you're like, yeah, because you're not thinking about them from the perspective of the Archangel Seth who came to Earth to be in love with a human woman. Oh, shit. I do remember the music video, <laughs> kind of. You don't and want the very... world to see me because I don't think that they'd understand. The Goo Goo Dolls. One of the greatest to ever do. <laughs> I agree. Couldn't, couldn't agree more, babe. <laughs> so bands, band splain, the f- forever Yasi Salek, band splaining 20 Why years from now. Why would you say that? <laughs> no, I just like, it's such a Are huge, you going to okay. make TikToks for the rest of your life? See Touché. your face when I ask that. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> well, I feel like it's such a like, you know, uh, you've got so many, so much to cover and you're so good at it but i feel like it's 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 also a huge undertaking <sighs> and but you're asking I, me that question i, I, I don't no, think I'm not at some TikToks. point you know what i mean like at some point a i shouldn't even know about new music anymore i should be like put out to pasture and not be concerning myself with those things i don't think anyone needs or wants to hear from like a 58 year old woman about the heyday of grunge music or whatever like i i think and hope that i'll eventually transition as we do we grow we evolve we change into perhaps some other sort of um creative pursuit but i do love doing it for now for the foreseeable future are you kidding i I talk about music for a living i'm a professional teenager it's awesome well if you get into biba doobie now in Mm -hmm. in 20 years you could be talking about the whole (laughs) (laughs) right that's what everyone wants to hear me talk about the mythology yeah (laughs) yeah yeah that's that's how uh we're gonna end it (laughs) um but Yasi Salek, it's been it's been a pleasure. I kind of almost feel like I selfishly get to talk to the person I get to listen to and kind of like hear your hear your banter IRL, which is really enjoyable. <laughs> I feel like having researched and experienced so much about music and the way that you do only gives you a so like it, it gives you so much of a like way to look at the world, not just music. I know it's like very like big and romantic, but it's like I feel like I agree. You know, like you say, the human experience. Um, yeah. 
and expression and how we connect to it. Do you, yeah, do you feel that? Yeah, I totally do. I, I actually feel like even more that every time I'm researching something, I learn so much about myself and it's always mirroring back to me something that I'm going through, through whatever larger themes I'm exploring from this artist. It's very cool. Talk about it in therapy. <laughs> <laughs> life imitating art perhaps that's what everyone's looking for when they resonate with your stuff or my stuff it's like s stories about yourself right <laughs> yeah i think so you want to see yourself in in the world yasi salek it's been a pleasure thank you so much for thank you for having me derek what a, what a treat everyone check out yasi's podcast band Splain. and remind me of your brand new podcast the name of it it's called 24 question party people <laughs> it's an interview show we interview musicians we, me, Very. me and my personalities, we interview musicians. Anyone, anyone super like unattainable that you, you want to get on? David Matthews. It's going to happen. I think so. It's inevitable. Have you met? We've met. We've met. He's a lovely man, but it's, it's inevitable that it will happen. It's only a matter of time. That sounds menacing and I don't mean it to. I just know in my heart that it's going to happen. <laughs> There's certain things that like you can be, one can be certain of. Exactly. Like, yeah, you doing Death something. taxes and Dave Matthews is coming on 24 question party people. Six months, I'd say, or less. Tops, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Yassi Salek. Yassi Salek Speaks Volumes is, is the podcast. And um, I appreciate you. Yassi Salek Speaks Volumes? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's So called. many volumes. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Um, Thank you. And um, thank you, everyone, for listening. Bye.